Carlson. I'm the editor in chief at Grassroots Undergraduate Literary and Arts Magazine, and today I'd like to welcome you to our poetry panel. With us today we have Andrew McFadden Ketchum, who earned an MFA in poetry from SIU. He's the editor for three anthologies, including Apocalypse Now and the online Home of the Week Dapor. He is now on a US tour for his first book of poetry, Ghost Gear. Please welcome Andrew McFadden Ketchum. Next, we welcome T.J. Jarrett, whose newest book, Zion, won the Crab Orchard Series in Poetry <coughs> as a competition and was published this year by Southern Illinois Press. She is a senior editor for Tupelo Quarterly and has won numerous scholarships for her work. Everyone, please welcome T.J. Jarrett. <laughs> we also have with us today Stephen D. Schroeder, who won the Devil's Kitchen Reading Award for Poetry. He is also the author of Torch First Ends, another collection of poems. You can also find his writing in New England Review, Crab Orchard Review, and the journal to name a few. He joins us today from St. Louis, where he's a professional resume writer. Let's welcome Stephen D. <laughs> and we also welcome Dan Albergati. His collection of poems, Millennial Teeth, won the Crab Orchard Series and Poetry Open Competition and was published by SAE Press this year. His works have also been published in the Cincinnati Review, Shenandoah, the Southern Review, the Virginian quarterly, and other journals. As an editor, Dan has worked on the Greensboro Review and the online journal Wacomal. He teaches creative writing at Coastal Carolina University. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Almagrati. <laughs> I want to start with the same question that Sarah started out with yesterday for our fiction writers, which is, why did you choose poetry? And can you think of a specific moment that you look back on and think, that's when I decided I wanted to write? Um, start with that and go with Dan. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know that anyone chooses poetry. I mean, it's it's kind of a cliche and it's you know zenish. Right? Uh, uh, Jan Burroway yesterday was making fun of the, the Zen thing a little bit, but poetry really does. I mean, choose you. Um, and I cannot uh, pinpoint a time when I when I kind of was taken over by poetry. I know that being made to read poems in school did make a difference because I went home and homework no longer felt like homework when I was reading <laughs> Coleridge, you know, and then Keats, um, and it just instantly to me felt like something that transcended all that. But it wasn't just writing; it felt almost like world making, and. Uh, I don't know, I think uh, my favorite definition of the writer has always been the novelist Saul Bellows, um, where he said that a writer is a reader moved to emulation. And so in reading those romantic poets, it's just like this sort of um, healthy envy. I wish I could do that. Um, my mother has a story about when I was seven years old and I read The Tiger for the first time. I would take my reading book and I would put it under my pillow and I would sleep on it and then I'd wake up and I'd read it again and then I'd take it to school and then I'd put it under my pillow every night um, in this very weird ritualistic OCD thing that made no sense to her. Um, my father's a minister, so I think there's a certain, about, a certain thing about the cadence of words and how they, I have always believed they mean something. Um, but I absolutely, I fought it every step of the way. Um, I work in IT, which is the farthest thing from words one would think you would get there, and I'm still writing. Um, and so it's not something you really shake. I think you find the love of something and you just kind of keep doing it, even though it doesn't quite make sense to you or anyone around you. Um, yeah, I, I can't say that I woke up wanting to be a poet <laughs> at all. I don't look at my bank account and think I want to be a poet, yeah. ever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's something that you just learn to love and it, it takes you and you feel like that's the only way you can communicate certain things, so. Yeah, I would, di I would ditto all of that. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, have tried not to be a poet numerous times, and it always uh, it, it brings me back in, kind of like the mob or something, you know. Um, and but I, I've been uh, pretty much a writer since I knew what uh, how to write words and like to read stories. And I hated poetry as a kid. I'm talking like seven, eight, nine years old. Um, and I wrote lots of fiction right off the bat. 
Um, it's very bizarre. Um, but then uh, my first job was at this uh, little produce. Uh, it's called the Produce Place. It's like a little health uh, food store, and it was mostly produce, as you might imagine. And <laughs> and my job, I was the cleanup boy. I was 14 years old. I thought I was 13, but my parents informed me it was illegal for me to work at 13, which I figured, well, I was probably still working at 13. But I was 14, so the whole I've been writing poems for 20 years thing, I have to wait a few months for that. But um, I was 14 years old. It was my first job. And I, was, I, I would go after school and sweep up and mop and clean things. And of course, didn't do a very good job because it was I was getting paid three fifteen an hour and, and uh, cleaning the floor at fourteen years old isn't much fun so they had to teach me like oh you've got to actually sweep up under things and you know be detailed and so one day I'm finally doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm sweeping up under this corn bin and this piece of corn wobbles out it's you know half rotten and into my mind pops the line what if I were this piece of corn <laughs> and, <laughs> And the you know the brilliance went on from there, right? <laughs> and it's it, it's funny because the first uh, poem in my first book is a, has a question. That's the first line and a half. Uh, something I noticed yesterday. I was like, well, that's weird. So it just happened. It was just like bam. And I wrote this poem. It's about this big, you know, and um, I that was it. All of a sudden, I was a poet, and it <laughs> never went away. Even though after college and not getting into an MFA right away, I was like screw poetry, I'm going to do everything but that, and it came back and of course ended up here at this wonderful place and have throughout the years tried to cut it out of my life, but it just keeps coming and forcing me back into it. So I think I, think I would agree with you guys, you don't get to pick it, it picks you. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure even now, if I want to be a poet. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, I would much rather be a novelist. And, uh, so I write stories, or I try to write stories, and the damn things just keep turning back into poems. Um, because, uh, partially because that's what I have the attention span for. I'll say shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and and uh, partially just because uh, part of writing for me is wanting to make the language as tight and compressed and torque as possible, and poetry is the way to do that. Um, but while there's no moment where I wanted to be a poet, I certainly always loved writing. Um, and one of the first things I can remember, uh, when I was five or six, I think, maybe in first grade, kindergarten, something like that, um, they asked, they had us write something about what do you want to be when you grow up, and I didn't say I wanted to be a writer, but I wrote this extended story about how I was going to be a policeman, but my only job was going to be uh, to give cheetahs speeding tickets for running too fast, <laughs> but that was, like, everybody thought that was so creative, and that was, like, the first moment that I had this sort of idea that I could entertain people with my writing. <laughs> Good. Ridiculous. I was asking for a second term on the first question, but if I had been really thinking, I would have also ended it with, with the idea of not choosing poetry, but it, it chooses you, with uh, reciting a very, very brief poem um, by Jack Gilbert, um, my favorite poet. This is, the, this is the first poem in his first book. It's six lines. It's called In Dispraise of Poetry. When the king of Siam disliked a courtier, he gave him a beautiful white elephant. The miracle beast deserves such ritual that to care for him properly meant ruin. <laughs> Yet to care for him improperly was worse. It appears the gift could not be refused. <laughs> we spoke a little bit yesterday about TJ's favorite rejection. And so I'd like to ask you today about <laughs> the difference between a good rejection and a bad rejection, and if you have any favorites or least favorites. Mm -hmm. There are no good rejections. Um, I'm not sure who was here for that. My favorite rejection actually was from Dan. Um, <laughs> it was my first um, rejection from poems that I'd sent out as an adult, and it was not a bad rejection. Um, a bad rejection is just says nothing. It's like, sorry, it's not a fit. Now, here's the difference. It's like now that I'm on the other side of the table. Um, 
Dan's rejection was great because it was very specific. It's like, I like this piece. I think it's working. It's not a fit for what we're doing right now. And the truth is, if I, if I or Dan or any editor bothers to write down like a specific piece that I'm reading, and I took the time, it is not a bad piece. That's a very good rejection because I'm actually responding to you. I cannot describe how little time I have on the editorial desk. Um, I read approximately every three months, because we're quarterly, obviously it's in the name. Um, I read about every month, personally, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 poems. Mm. Um, and I have a full-time job. So I don't have time to pick out which poem that I like most in your packet. And if I did, I really did like it. It doesn't mean no, it means not now, or mm. not quite, or we're not there yet. Um, I'm, I try to be fastidious about making sure that when I talk to writers that I, mean, I understand that this is your job and understand that that is my job. And it does not really, I don't feel like it's a gatekeeping exactly. I do think that it's, um, I'm curating a magazine and curating means that it's, you're not just competing against all the poems that I get across my desk. You're also competing with what I'm putting together right now and sometimes when you're putting together a book, you know, getting together an anthology or you're putting together a magazine, you're really looking at what the pieces are in relation to each other. And sometimes it doesn't quite fit. Um, but yeah, no, like there, there are absolutely rejections if I, yeah, if I actually write your name on a piece of paper. <laughs> booyah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Anybody else can comment as well? Oh, um, Bad, good questions, bad questions. I, I once um, sent a poem, and I'm one of these people that never was comfortable with simultaneous submission. I, I did it a couple times as an experiment. It made me, so I almost never sent poems out to multiple journals at once, you know? And certainly the journal didn't allow multiple submissions. I didn't flaunt that all. So I would send things out and wait. Sometimes it feels like forever, mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes it is and forever. And sometimes it is forever. Um, <laughs> the, the, the New Yorker never responded. So, yeah. um, but the, the worst one I ever got was after um, waiting 15 months, getting my self-addressed stamped envelope back with my cover letter being the only thing inside, yeah. with the word sorry scrawled across the bottom. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, and this happens. This happens to everybody. And, and, um, but I, I would just say that the writers in the room, I know well, there's student writers in the room, um, it's really easy to get seduced um, by the idea of publication as being some kind of substantial reward in, in the writing life. The writing is the only reward in the writing life. Just keep, try to keep perspective, keep that in mind. If you get obsessed with publication um, and, and measuring your worth on acceptance or rejection there, very quickly, your art, your work, gets transformed into, in your mind, you don't know what's happening, into a commodity. Mm. Something you're trying to sell. And that's bad for the work. It really is. By all means, send your work out for publication. I hope it gets published, but never lose sight that the work is the work. And the work is what determines whether you're success or failure, not an editor's decision on work. I'll tell you one other story about rejection. Um, the, the wonderful poet Spencer Reese sent out his first book manuscript in one form or another for 19 years before it was accepted. 19 years out to the first book contests. And when it won, it won the Bakeless Prize from the Bread Love Writers Conference, which was published by what? That would be, uh, that would be Harvard. Um, not, uh, it's like Grey Wolf, is it? Was it Grey Wolf? It was not Grey Wolf, but it, anyway, it was a, a big commercial. Hope Mifflin, oh, sorry, Hope yeah. Mifflin. Um, and uh, selected by um, Louise Glick, who wrote an introduction for it. And so that's, you know, loser, 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 so I, I always tell that story as testimony to the idea that um, persistence in the writing life is omnipotent. Can I say one more thing? I, I'm sorry, we're chatty. Um, 
I also would like to warn people that having something published is not the end all be all of the piece. I read lots of crappy things that get published every day. Sure. Like Paris Hilton has a book, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if she can read, I was surprised. Um, so I really think when you're sitting down at the page, the best thing for you is to do what's right by the poem. And if you do what's right by the poem and your aesthetic, it will follow. And I know it sounds like some kind of platitude, but you kind of have to have your eye on that due north of what you want your work to be. Um, and no one should be sitting around writing a, like sending me a poem about laundry when nine times out of 10, I've got a stack of laundry is probably not the best, because I just have bad days. There are days that I read things that are great, that I thank God I'm on a committee of other writers because I will completely say pass and then come back sometime like, wow, that is pretty good. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, because we're human. It's, we're not, you know, this, it's not this, you know, big thing that happens that I become smarter when someone appoints me an editor. I just become Tanya who happens to have another job. Um, but yeah, I think you really have to have a good sense of what you want um, and not just, as we said, someone said earlier um, the other day about having the pose of being a writer. Like that is really empty. Having the actual, you know, it's like lying in bed with your accomplishments is a beautiful thing. Lying in bed with like, you know, just some new clothes from J. Crew is not. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would really kind of more emphasize really getting to know who you are and what your work is supposed to be. She you guys have something else to say? Yeah. I think you have to just not care. Um, in sports, you know, they say that the best athletes have bad short-term memory. You know, they throw an interception, <laughs> then they go out and they throw a touchdown. And that's pretty much what publishing is, right? I mean, you get a bunch of rejections and you get acceptances. I mean, I've been submitting poems for, you know, a long time. Like, I started very early. And, I mean, I guess I've probably received, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight thousand rejections. <laughs> and I've published, I don't know, like, not not a hundred poems, total. Um, and honestly, I just think you have to just not care. Um, you every rejection you get, you should celebrate because that's one step closer to someone saying yes. Um, the deeper that I get into the publishing world and the academic world, and the more I learn about how this all works, the more I see how insanely overtaxed everybody is. Everybody in this room is overtaxed. Everybody at this table is overtaxed. All of us. So the notion that you're getting your work rejected because you're not good is simply not true. It may be true, it might not be true, it's not worth thinking about. What's worth thinking about is working hard and writing the best poems you can, which is what these guys are saying. And just, you know, it just doesn't really matter that much. I submitted my book for five years. Now, now that you've told the story of 19, I feel like mine's kind of pathetic. But I submitted my book for five years. I sent it to something like 100 total um, not individual prizes, but the same 20 prizes basically for five years in a row. Literally, and a lot of people in here know this, I literally never received anything. Wasn't a finalist, wasn't a simile finalist, didn't have a nice note, I mean nothing. The rejection he got with the, the letter, or your cover letter in the envelope, that's what I got from the University of Arkansas Press four years in a row. Fifth year, I got a phone call. Hey, is this Andrew and Fadge Ketchum? Yes. Hey, we want to publish your book. Holy shit. You know, run. I'm glad it's not just me. Yeah, that does I literally yeah. ran into my living room and tried to hug one of my rabbits. Not a good plan. You know, and, and, and people like the book. I mean, maybe people don't like it also, but I mean, I'm receiving tons of, you know, wonderful thoughts on it. And, you know, so it just, it's just a matter of time and effort, tool and materials. And it's terrifying. It's yeah, terrifying it's too. It's terrifying. Like it's, it's terrifying. yeah. <laughs> and I would just say keep in mind that the rejection never goes away. I mean, everybody here is relatively successful as a poet, and we probably get rejected 90% of the time if we send anything. Um, and so the, you, you have to measure your success some other way. Um, and, and the one thing I would say is, as, as it's sort of established, a good rejection is when someone says something about the poems and, and, and maybe why it was close, why they liked it, or why, why it didn't quite make it. And you can take that and, and at least think about it. Maybe it'll help the poem, and maybe you don't have to actually take the advice. Um, and sometimes, though, I, I did want to uh, mention uh, people will, will send a personalized rejection that's actually uh, 
about band rejection um, in a way. I think they think they're being helpful. There was one I got from a poet I've met who's a fairly successful poet, and I sent him work, and he sent back a note that said, um, there's a fine line between poetry and man free association. <laughs> Are you sure? the wrong side of the line for me. Um, and so I think he thought he was being constructive and helpful about my poems, and, and in all honesty, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> One of my students got a rejection that said all these nice things, and then it said, however, it lacks inner necessity. I emailed him, and I said, I don't want to have a feud about this. Define inner necessity for me. <laughs> I would love to see what that actually is. So yeah, anything like that, I mean, again, short-term memory, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. <coughs> But also, just anything you get like that, Steve, you know, you know, you just, just rolls off the back. It yeah. has to. Um, and that's an editor not being an editor. That's an editor who's confused the role of the editor, which is to be to serve the work, serve the author, and be invisible. <laughs> that's, that's what an editor should do. Um, that if ego creeps into it, if you think you are some kind of arbiter of justice as an editor, <laughs> get out. You know, I'm serious. And that's what that person's doing. Um, what Jake out of New York told me, he once got a rejection that, that said, send this one through the typewriter a few more times, old chap. Oh, <laughs> who does that? We've gone on and on. We're sorry, we can go on with this for day. You know, it's actually a real. We have drinks day. about this. Yeah. It's like the best yeah. rejection ever, actually. <laughs> All right, this question is for Andrew McFadden Ketchum. You've been on tour for Ghost Year for a few months now. Uh, can you tell us what it's like to take a book on the road and how it compares to, say, a Motley Crue tour? <laughs> <laughs> Motley Crue has popped That's, up in our discussion this weekend. Totally. Um, being on a book tour is the most amazing thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm legitimately this happy, you know, like this is real. I mean, I, you know, I've ever since I was a little kid, I've wanted to have a book. Um, didn't know it was going to be poetry, uh, but I wanted a book and, um, you know, I've always wanted to, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. And so all of my friends are musicians. I mean, literally every single one of them, it gets really old. Um, but I mean, you know, when they, when we were kids and they were, you know, you could make albums on your own, you know, and they would go out and get a crappy van and drive around and, and get, and do shows and have, you know, barely any money, but you know, they had a lot of fun and they got to spread their work around. And so when the book, when I learned the book was coming out, I thought, well, I guess I'll do something like that. Now I have a real, I have like eight real jobs, you know, so I can't just get in a van and drive wherever I want. But um, due to wonderful things like Devil's Kitchen Literary Festival, Southern Festival of Books, all the different universities, um, there are there there are ways to put together um, a tour, and uh, I did not see it going as well as it has. I had no idea I would I would give this many readings and go to this many things. Um, but uh, I just made myself available and made myself, you know, affordable. Um, and, and these times, it's you know everybody's struggling um, and having a great time with it. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the what, how's it different from Motley Crue? Well, I'm not doing any uh, hard drugs uh, on the road. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, you know um, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. Every reading, Do I have like groupies? millions of fans. I don't, I don't think we get groupies. <laughs> we, yeah, you know. And we um, have no roadies. Well, speak for yourself. I got a roadie. I don't get a roadie. We're, I'm, I'm doing it. We were roadies. We're like each other's roadies. I guess. <laughs> we're both from Nashville. We've all been like, together for yeah, those, yeah. Um, weekends here. Um, Do you want to? If I could just say too, just in, with all due respect to the question too, that um, it is it is fun to talk about what happens when you get the book, but let me come back to it again. <laughs> Alan Shapiro um, says that, that the things like external reward, like judging yourself by publication, even when it gets to book publication. Now I know it's fabulous, and it was fabulous when I got it. I'm the same writer the day after yeah. Boa published my accepted my first book as, as I was the day before. I'm the same writer. The day after John Dribble called me and said you both won the open competition, which is a very, very happy day. I was the same writer the next day, so I was like, all that stuff, it's cotton candy. It looks ample, but it's all taste and no nourishment. 
So just, I, I just want to remind everyone of that because again, um, it's going to sound like I'm sucking, you know. Is, I know it can sound obnoxious too from a published writer. If you're an unpublished writer out there, say so don't care about publication. Yeah. <laughs> but I swear, it's so harmful to get really, really obsessed with it. So. Um, this question is for TJ. Uh, one of our editors asked about the Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you um, found poetry in your software work. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> hell, no. <laughs> um, in the sense that I work in a software, I will say that as a software developer, that being a software developer nurtures my virtues, which is I'm a team player, I communicate better between plenty of people. I have literally no I don't have, I have any American citizens on my team. So I have people who speak lots of different languages in lots of different places. I have to be very succinct and make sure that I communicate things that we have to do quite well. Um, but I don't really think it really, I mean, in the sense, I don't even know how it, how it would inform my poetry at all. Um, and I'm pretty judicious about this is my private life, this is my private thing, this is how I feel about the world. And I, I'm very stingy about it with my coworkers. And also what, when I, with my coworkers were really busy. Um, I will say that there's this, I have a story about, we're at, we have a quarterly planning meeting where like all of the business owners are all together and all the software developers were talking about the projects we want to get through the quarter. But sometimes there's these little bowling moments and so, we're going around the table and people are talking about different burial rituals throughout their cultures, which I don't know, we're just morbid, I don't know how that happened. And so my friends, the Hindis, were talking about this is how we want to be buried, and then like someone was like an Episcopalian, and it gets to me, and my response is, I would be really happy that once I'm dead, that people leave me dead, and if there's a zombie apocalypse, I'm going to be the maddest woman on earth. <laughs> I don't, it just came out like I don't want to be born again. I don't want any harps. I just like to be dead. That would be great because I'm really tired. Um, and that just came out. And people were like, "Is this what you do as a writer?" And like that was one of those like really quiet. Like, does she like this all the time? Um, I think I just had this moment where I forgot that I was like it's not supposed to be whatever. But um, yeah. I mean, I think. There's, something, there's also another virtue in having something outside the writing. Like it cannot be your entire life. You are going to go, it will drive you crazy. Um, I appreciate having something to do from nine to whenever I finish working every day. Absolutely appreciate it. It's not that I don't do my reading. It's not that I don't do the work. It's not that I don't sit down and write. But there's gotta be something outside of that because you are going to go nuts otherwise. And also, sciences are so clean. I can be right. I can be absolutely, without a doubt, right. There's a right answer, and there's a right number in the sciences, where there never is with poetry. Mm -mm. And the next question is kind of related. Um, how do you find balance between, like, say, a day job and your writing? I don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> my, my day job is kind of connected. I do teach. I teach creative writing. Um, but I'm also, as of this semester, an administrator, kind of the chair of my English department now. And uh, I tell you, it's, it's very hard so far. I'm still negotiating that. Um, yeah, <laughs> sleep. Like, yeah, we just don't sleep. It's like it's not a lot of sleep in that. So it's All right. Um, so I write resumes for a living. Actually, I manage a team of writers. Um, and the two types of writing really don't cross over much at all. Um, the, the, in style, anyway. Um, occasionally, I'll sneak internal rhyme into a resume, and I think that's great. <laughs> um, and a lot of themes from the resumes cross over into the poetry, so it's, it's actually kind of helpful in that way, just sort of giving me a kind of material. Um, but in practical terms, uh, I think it's a good question. Um, obviously, you're, you're going to need some kind of job to write poetry on the side. Um, and, and that's just basically what it is. You you have the ideas, you make sure you remember the ideas, you have a little notebook with you all the time, you scratch something down, and then in the few minutes when you're not working, or in the hour when you get home, or in the hour when you wake up in the morning, you actually do some of that writing. And, and as long as you're passionate about it, that's just the way it has to be. 
a routine. You have to develop a routine. If you're going to write poetry, as Steve was saying, you have to have another job. That's part of being a poet. That's part of one of, that's one of the interesting aspects of being a poet. It's not a job. Um, it's outside of the typical uh, economy of the world. Um, it's a different type of economy. It's outside capitalism. It doesn't matter how many books you sell of poetry, your, your royalty is not going to pay the bills. So you have to have another job. Um, and I remember before I um, got in here, um, I was really lamenting uh, to my mom, you know, I'm trying to write, I just don't have the time, I don't have the energy. And she said, well, I don't know a lot about writing, but what I hear is that if you have, a, you have to have a routine. And she said, can you set up a routine? And I said, well, I, well, I, you know, I don't get, I don't have to work until a certain time. I guess if I got up at 6 a.m. and wrote until 10, I'd have four hours. And I literally did that until about two years ago. I'm getting older, I need more sleep now. Um, so I go to bed um, you know, a little earlier and sleep a little later. Um, but like my, I have four or five paying jobs, maybe even six, I can't remember at this point. Um, so to balance all of that stuff. And then I have several non-paying jobs beyond being a poet as an editor. Um, I, a lot of the work I do is, it, there's no money coming in from that. It's because I believe in, in poetry. I don't care about money um, as long as I can pay the bills and do my wife uh, fairly well. I'm happy with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, if you're not writing because you don't have time, it's because you're not making time for writing. There is time. There will be times when there isn't time, but overall there is time and you should be getting to work. That's how I feel about it. I always I have friends of mine who uh, wonder how I get writing done and then I always look at them and I wonder how they have three kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would treat it like you have, like it is a precious thing to you. If it's that important, you will make time, you will be there, you'll be there on birthdays and ruby weddings, that's what you're gonna do. And you make it, and it's and it's not, and then you start making choices. I mean, it's really about. And this is like this basic time management seminar. Do I want to go to the mall today, or do I want to edit these poems I have? Um, and that's just how that's going to have to be. Edit them at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> or edit them at the mall. <laughs> All right. One more question before we open it up to the audience for questions. Um, what advice would you like to give to all of our poets and <laughs> you can only talk I, for two minutes. I know. <laughs> I, 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 so, you know, I, I know I, I, I've said it too much um, about not getting obsessed with, with external endorsement. It's just you. It's just you. But also, um, ego, in any case, is, is detrimental to poetry. Um, it's to, to really, if you really want to be a poet, if you want to, to, um, to write poetry that matters, it's, it's not a self-aggrandizing act, it's a self-abnegating act. Uh, John Keats says the poet has no identity. <laughs> and are you willing to make that sacrifice? And also, um, you, can't, you can't be a writer without being a reader, and you've got to be just an omnivorous reader. You've got to be reading poetry all over the place. Poetry outside of our tradition, poetry inside our tradition, poetry published last week, published, poetry published 400 years ago. It's, and I hear maybe young writers sometimes saying, I don't want my work influenced by read. That's bullshit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you think that for a second, bullshit, read. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I would actually expand on Dan. I would say that being a poet is, is writing poetry is a self-advocating act, absolutely. I would also say, yes, read, 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 but read the newspaper, read what's yeah. going on with the world, be a part of the world, be a world citizen, talk to other people outside of your own cocoon, like get out of your comfort zone. There's so many things that about being a writer, which is about being a better person, which I find some writers who miss that class, but, <laughs> Um, but being a better person and being a broader person and being more open to experiences and to move humbly on the earth among people. Um, 
it's very hard to write about a character when you've not put yourself aside and really interrogated what it is to be that character. You're not doing it humbly. And I read lots of poems where people are, I think Strom Thurmond is an asshole. Well, yeah, okay, maybe empirically he is kind of an asshole. But I think we all know that. If we're gonna write a poem about Strom Thurmond, we're gonna talk about him at night taking off his shoes every night. And even Strom Sherman feels shame sometimes. Um, that is the compelling poem, and it's not about what everybody else thinks. It's about getting into the character, really thinking about the character. Um, and if it comes to you, it means not doing, like you, everyone inside has their internal press release organization. Um, that means putting that aside and really talking about truths about yourself, which are hard. Wow and it's true, and it's the stuff that you can only do at night because you may break into tears at your desk. Um, it's real honesty. I think those things, and that's the kind of thing that is outside of poetry, really. That's about just being a better person and bringing that kind of large heartedness into the work. I just wrote down a press release, arrow, honesty. That's about <laughs> the best way I've heard that said. Um, Advice, oh my God, uh, slow down, slow down. You are going to live, most likely, a long time, longer than you want to live. You're not <laughs> in a hurry. Slow down, I mean, really. I, and when I say that to you, I'm also saying it to myself. I'm saying, it's cool, take your time. Good things will come if you work really hard. And that's, that's the thing. Um, that I really think shows up over and over and over. If, if you're lamenting that your work isn't improving and you're not getting where you want to get to, and then I ask you, well, how many hours are you writing? Uh, you know, this is funny because Judy and I agree on, on this from, from day one. Um, if you're not putting in the actual hours, the actual time, then that's your problem. You know, that's not poetry's problem. That's not the publishing world's problem. That is your problem. And, and about half the people that I know who are, who are poets and who are trying to be poets or exactly, what exactly that means, about half of them are not working that hard and they're not succeeding. You see it over and over and over at all levels. Um, and so, so really, I mean, that's the big thing for me is actually putting in the real time. I mean, Benjamin Percy, um, says he treats writing like a job. And if you haven't noticed, he puts out a lot of books, you know. Um, and and uh, there are different ways you can spend that time. But if you're not, uh, if you don't have on your Google Calendar, write from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. or whatever it is you need from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Me and Carrie James Evans, he used to literally call me at 6 a.m. to wake me up and I would say, good night. That's not a joke, a like friend. literally. Because he wrote at night and I wrote in the mornings, um, different different processes, um, and lo and behold, we wrote a lot of poems and are making our way. And um, I hate to put it this way, but people that I know who are trying to succeed as writers and aren't putting the work in are not succeeding as writers. It's back to the sports metaphors. You know, you don't throw touchdown passes because you're out at the bar. It's that simple. That's how you succeed. Go to the bar too, have some fun, but you gotta work hard first. I'm glad you mentioned uh, sports metaphors because I'm going to uh, do a little sports thing. I, I'd like to uh, address the writing process itself, um, which I feel like I haven't said enough about. Um, in the movie Bull Durham, there's a part where uh, Kevin Costner is giving Tim Robbins advice on succeeding in the major leagues. And one of the things he says is, um, you have to live with, uh, or you have to act with fear and arrogance. And I think that applies to the writing process in this way. The fear is whatever you write down the first time, think to yourself, this isn't good enough, this can be better, I can make it better. Mm -hmm. And you keep going, you write it again, you write it again, you make it better, you always think, I can make this better. And then even when the poem's finished and you go on to the next one, think, all right, that poem's finished, this next poem can be better, I can make it better. And then the arrogance part is um, simply the act of any of us being public poets. Okay? You have to think, um, for this poem that's done, that you were just thinking, this isn't good enough, I can make it better about it. You now have to think, this is good enough that people should want to read it. It's good enough 
for people to enjoy or to take something from, yeah. and I want to share it with people. And so you have to do both of those things. And, and for I, I would imagine it, it's certainly true for me. I imagine it's true for most poets. There is a sort of uh, bipolar thing where you hate your poems, you love your poems, you hate your poems, you love your poems. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so just uh, be willing, willing and ready to do that. Um, and I would also say uh, if you do get uh, if you do publish a book. Uh, you can you can enjoy that. It's 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 great. So don't worry too much if you do happen to get your work out in a book. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last yeah, thing. One, the one last thing. This is what my mother told me several months ago. Um, and I'm gonna say it just like she said it to me. Tanya and Janine Jarrett, you cannot sleep your way to the top. You can only sleep your way to the middle. Somewhere you gotta get some work done. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> follow up on uh, Stephen's great uh, full Durham reference. Um, it reminds me, I, I've already cited uh, a lecture that Alan Shapiro once gave once a day, but he also said in that lecture that um, to, to succeed as a poet, you need equal parts arrogance and humility. And it's not that you need to be resting in the middle, like in Spinal Tap, what, you know, uh, the, the basis says that, that Nigel and, and uh, David are, are like fire and ice, and his role in the band is to be lukewarm water. <laughs> you can't be lukewarm water about it, right? You can't just be sitting in the middle. You have to have equal parts experience and humility, which means that it oscillates. And I think this is why, I mean, there's a pretty long history of, of writers, a lot of writers, dealing with um, bipolar disorder. Um, by all means, don't let it take over your life in that way. But I think if you allow yourself the moments of arrogance and allow yourself the moments of humility, that's how you have those equal parts. And I think because writers often feel those low points of humility, I think that's what makes us want that external ju judgment and praise I was talking about earlier. It makes us get obsessed with publication. Understand that your low points, that is natural. That you've got to hate your work sometimes. I read Millennial Teeth after it was published in the Crab Orchard series. You know, I read it one day, I read through my own work, and I'm like, this is genius. <laughs> I read it the next day, I'm like, this it is sucks. shit. It happens I every time. I can't believe yes. I wrote these terrible poems and I published them. The next day, this is going to be read in 200 years. <laughs> the next day, Jesus, are you serious, Albert guy? And it just, it's, it, that, that never goes away. So, if you're feeling that kind of thing, embrace it as part of the process. Yeah. Don't don't be. And don't listen either at the either extreme too hard. Don't believe it. All right, I think we have time for a couple questions. Can you talk about uh, mentorship in poetry? Like who have been your poetry mentors, either actual people or people that you've read that have confirmed, yes, this is what I should be doing? I, uh, my mom's a college professor, and her office mate was um, Paul Rankin, who is a wonderful, well, was a wonderful poet. Um, and I think at the time, had something like four or five books to her name. Um, I was 12 years old, and I was writing a poem a day because I don't know that's what 12-year-olds do, I guess. I don't know. And uh, so she ignored it for some time, and then she realized that I was going to be doing this, so she might as well just, just do a quality check. And so she reads through my journal, and she sits there, just quiet, and she's like, well, this is, this is shit. Um, if you're going to do this every day, and you insist on doing this every day, let's have, some, let's have some boundaries around it. So she actually, I would get like an assignment online a week, and I would get an assignment on meter a week, and I would get, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if she knew at the time that I would be a poet. She died when she was 45, when I was 20, it's like 22. Um, but I cannot tell you how invaluable it was that she loved me and believed in me, and she wanted me, if I was going to write, if I were going to write poetry, I would write it as if I were cognizant of how poetry works, and I needed to know what poetry did. Um, and so I had one-on-one -on -one training for, I guess, about almost seven or eight years um, because she loved me and she was a good person. So when I have people ask me questions, I know that it's my responsibility to pay that forward. 
because yeah. not everyone's going to have somebody to do that for eight years. Eight years of really, really bad 12 year old, what the hell did I have to talk about poems? <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, it happens, and it happens to everyone. I think the writing community, in some ways, as treacherous as it can be, there are plenty of people who will reach out to you and help you. And I'm always surprised at how much that happens. And I want to be known as that person because I had that happen to me. Yeah, I'm glad that you talked, you, you got to the importance of being a, a good mentor. I, of all the things that I think I've, I've done in my life, um, the most rewarding spiritual side of it uh, has been finding young poets who need help and actually being able to help them. Um, and, and older poets too. I mean, I've got students who are certainly older than me. Um, and it, it, to, to, to be able to do that for another person, it's pretty unbelievable. The great mentors that I find are the poets who I read and I go, oh, that's how you do it. That, those are the people I latch on to. If you want to know who they are, go to www.poemoftheweek.org. I'm completely unafraid to show everyone who I read. Uh, anyone on there I read, and almost all of them are alive. Um, and uh, many of them are sitting right here and out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, having good mentors and being a good mentor, honestly, at the end of the day, I think that's what actually makes poetry happen. That is why poetry is so powerful, because it's a community act. It is not something you do in isolation. You do part of it in isolation. But when you're reading poetry and you're writing poetry at, in the darkness of your bedroom at you know midnight, you are communing with the gods. I mean, that is what you're doing. It is a community act all the way through. All right. Um, I, I don't teach, and I also didn't go to an MFA program, so I think I have a fairly non-traditional experience with mentorship. But um, it, it certainly goes back to, uh, to uh, what everybody's been saying about reading a lot uh, across a wide range of different uh, people, and you, you'll find something that's going to be your model. And uh, um, for me, I think the biggest one when I was at the age where I was developing fastest as a poet was E.E. Uh, e. Cummins. Who, who very much informs my work still. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, teachers who, uh, in high school and, and college both, who uh, encouraged me to be way better than I was at the time because I was not really a good writer yet. Um, and, and so yeah, it, it's, it's certainly been critical even if it was not in the sort of usual one. I know we're about out of time now, but you had a question as well, we have time. I, I believe in assembling the collection, writing poems and assembling the collection. Um, Ta Tanya here is, uh, we talked about this the other day, she said she's very project based and I've never been that way. I, I write poems to, to my obsessions and so there, there are themes that hold them together, you know, um, but then I assemble a book from the poems I've written, but other people, I mean, she could talk more about writing to a collection, but um, I've always found that I can't think about a book when I'm writing poems. And I do think there's a potential problem. I'm, I'm going to say this, this is not true of Tommy's work, but I think one, one there is a danger in, in conceiving of the book when you're writing poems. And that is that you conceive of a big arc, and the temptation is to allow yourself to write poems that fill in spaces. That, so you allow yourself to write mediocre poems that, that serve a narrative function, in other words. And every poem, I think, needs to be there on its own. Um, so I'm not, there's not a bit of filler in, in <laughs> today's work, but I think... I know people who do that. It yeah, drives me crazy. Yep. Yeah. Um, I will say, yes, I am a project poet. Um, <laughs> however, for every poem that you see in that book, there are probably two poems I've thrown out of that book. Right. Um, you also have to, if you say, today I'm going to write a book about, I don't know, red ponies, um, there is a point where you have the project and then the project goes away because you're wrong. 
And you have to say that you're wrong. Like, hey, this is not working. What, how about I write some more poems and maybe I can take these poems. What are these poems really doing? Because in my, in like my forward mind, my first mind, I'm like, I'm gonna write a book about blah, blah, blah. I can promise you, I never planned on writing Zion. Zion was not a plan. Like, I thought I was gonna write something, else, something about Mississippi. Um, the characters that popped up and the conversations that happened had nothing to do with what I had planned on doing. And you have to be open to yourself and let, let you like, this is what the spirit wants to do and this is not what the project wants. Um, things that I learned from IT, sometimes it just does like the project you want is not gonna happen and you need to let it go. That's a super big question that I think I ask myself every day. So how do you put this book together? Oh, like you don't really know. Um, I think if you live with um, some poems for long enough, they start to speak to you. They start to tell you where they need to be. I rearranged Ghost Gear quite a bit, but um, after about two years of doing that, I figured out that it needed to be chronological, more or less. It was a building's roman. Um, I realized that, which was a little bit hard to come to grips with for a number of reasons. Um, you know, in a review that someone wrote of it, they called it a memoir, and I almost choked. I was like, well, I made up a lot of this, so, <laughs> you, know, you know, creative nonfiction. Uh, the, the essential truths are true, and then from there you, you have some license, quite a bit of license. Um, but then the, the, my second book, and it's not a book yet, it's, I haven't submitted it or anything, but it's, it's going to be sort of ready this winter. Um, it's, it's a very specific book, it's about a specific person um, and something that went down with, with her. And, uh, but I didn't think about the book in the sense of like kind of what Dan is saying, like I didn't worry about what's the story, where is it going, I just said well I'm going to write about this person and sort of in this, uni I'm going to stay in this universe. And the book has slowly but surely written itself. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you write a poem or a short story, once the poem and short story starts taking over, then you know you're doing something right. When, you're, when you have all this control and you're forcing things on the poem or the story, it feels flat, it feels artificial, it doesn't feel like a, like a, a real thing in the world. When it starts to feel that way, you know you're on the right track. And I, I think that probably most of us would say that at some point in the putting together of a book, you start, it starts to sort of put itself together a little bit more, and you just have to trust it. And then, of course, go back into that more analytical side that says, okay, well, let's examine each poem and see exactly how it works, and go back and forth between sort of the analytical and the spiritual, maybe, is a way to think about it. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the one little thing I would add is, uh, for me, whichever way you approach uh, putting, putting the book together, I think, the thing you should do is um, start with more than enough and then pare down <laughs> rather than starting with not enough and trying to write into that. Um, in, in both of my books, and it will surely be the case in my third book whenever that happens, um, I, I eliminated many poems who were perfectly good poems because they didn't fit just right in the book. So I had way too much material, but by the time I had cut it down to the best book it could be, it was the right amount at that point. So it, I wasn't trying to force something in there just because I needed one more poem. All right, thank you all very much for coming, and let's give a round of applause for that.